Now, one more tidbit in regards to this picture that I carry everywhere I go with me. I've had this a very long time. I know y'all can't see it, but it's a picture of Jesus. And I carry it, and I know that Jesus probably didn't look like this. But when I close my eyes, I can see this picture of Jesus. This is who I picture. But our Friday night study in Desire of Ages is intended to know this Jesus. It's intended to really come to understand what is righteousness. We talk about righteousness by, the faith, by faith all the time. But unless we know what righteousness is in the face of Christ, in his life, unless we can truly understand what righteousness looked like, worked out, there's no context for us at all. It's just a word that goes right over the top of our head. So on Friday nights, we are going over through the book Desire of Ages, really delving into what did righteousness look like in the face of Christ. Now, this morning... Our sermon title is called The Fair Conductor. (laughs) When I was just a boy, I I couldn't have been no more than six years old, maybe not even that old. I had spent the weekend with my grandparents, and my grandfather, as usual, part of the, the attraction was to go to church with him. And I had been to church with him, and as usual on the weekends, I slept in bed with him, and he would tell me all about the the signs of the times, I, he picked that topic to, to talk to me about. But he was always telling me about the end of the world when I was a kid. And it would, it would kind of excite me, but yet terrify me. And this particular weekend had come to an end. My mom and dad come pick me up later that evening. And in the back of the car, I was small enough to, in that old Buick to be sitting in the floorboard behind my dad's and my mom's seat. And I had my head on the back seat. And I started thinking about my parents. What happens if Jesus comes and they're lost? And I remember I began crying. And my mother heard me and she says, Damon, what is wrong with you? And she thought I was crying because I had left my grandparents' house. But I was crying for a very different reason. And I never told her why. I was worried about my family. And that became a predominant theme from that age throughout all of my life. I am what seems to be hounded by the thought of my loved ones and friends and family members. And when I see people, it's almost like I just can't go out into public where there's masses of people and to think, what is their eternal destiny, especially in the light of current developments in the world today? I cannot help but to think, what is going to happen to them? And so the first time I read this vision, it just struck a chord in my heart from a Victorian era in 1882. I want to read it to you. I saw the rapidity with which this delusion was spreading A train of cars was shown me going with the speed of lightning. The angel bade me look carefully, and I fixed my eyes upon the train, and it seemed that the whole world was on board, that there could not be one left. Said the angel, they are binding in bundles, ready to be burned. Then he showed me the conductor who appeared like a stately fair person, whom all passengers looked up to and reverenced. I was perplexed and asked my attendant angel who it was. He said, it's Satan. He's the conductor in the form of an angel of light. He has taken the world captive. They are given over to strong delusions to believe a lie that they may be damned. This agent, the next highest in order to him, is the engineer and other of his agents are employed in different offices as he may need them. And they are all going with lightning speed to perdition. I asked the angel if there were none left. He bade me look in an opposite direction, and I saw a little company traveling on a narrow pathway. All seemed to be firmly united, bound together by the truth in bundles or companies. Said the angel, the third angel is binding or sealing them in bundles for the heavenly garner. This little company looked careworn as if they had passed through severe trials and conflicts, and it appeared as if the sun had just risen from behind a cloud and shone upon their countenance, causing them to look triumphant as if their victories were nearly one. 
first time I read that dream and I thought about it, this scene come flooding into my mind, it's terrifying. To picture a train loaded with people from the world, flashing by, and you're on the outside looking in the windows, and inside there, they're having a good old time. They're talking about politics, and, and they're talking about sports, and they're, and they're talking about their bank accounts, and, and the things that they got going on, they're laughing, and they're eating, and they're just carrying on. You, you get the imagery. They're just having a good old time inside that train. It's like a luxury train, and, and behind the wheel is the fair conductor who is Satan himself standing there smiling because he knows where the train is headed, but the people on board do not. That is terrifying. And yet there's another group, another group of people that are not on that train, and they look like they've just come from the jungles of Saigon to a war. They're not happy. They're not gay. They're not, they're not lighted up with good times. They're careworn. They're tired. They're broken. And it's a little small company in unity, and all they have in this earth is one another. And they're not on that train. There's two companies presented. It's all through the scriptures, these two ideas of these two classes of people. Now, if you'll grant my imagination an audience for, for a second, I thought about that train that goes flying by. A train where people are very happy to be on, cheering and laughing. But you look through the windows of that train and you see something more than just people on that train, you see family members, you see mom, dad, uncle, aunts, cousins, friends, brothers, sisters, grandchildren. That is the reality of the dream. The only question that matters to me is who's on that train? And with lightning speed, they don't know how quickly this thing could come to an end in this world. The fair conductor has another name. Isaiah rightly portrayed him in chapter 27. Isaiah, the 27th chapter, verse 1 says, In that day, the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay that reptile that is in the sea, in that day, sing to her. Oh, sing to her. We're going to talk about who we're to be singing to. But before that, God is saying, there is coming a day when I'm going to take this fair conductor and I'm going to put his miserable life to an end. But before he can do that, God has got to rescue the people on the train. Leviathan in Canaanite mythology was a seven-headed serpent from the sea. It's very similar when you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 3, right? There is a beast from the sea with seven heads. John is borrowing from language that they were familiar with. They all understood who this serpent was. In fact, when you go to the book of Revelation, just to get a, a little bit of idea of what you're up against, it's not just a myth that we're up against in chapter 12, verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. This is who Isaiah is talking about. And in verse 4, he takes out a third of the angels. In verse 5, he takes out the Son of God. In verse 6, he takes out the New Testament early church. In verse 7, he has committed war against all of heaven. And in verse 17, he has an especial hatred for those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Think about what I just said. He took out the Son of God. He took out a third of the angels. He committed war against God in heaven. And he has an especial hatred for you. This fair conductor has but one agenda, and that is to kill, destroy every human being that he can. And he doesn't play fair. He uses everything in your life that is around you, everything that influences you, everything that he can put his hands on to get to you, to tear us down, to kill us, to destroy us, to keep us on the train. In verse 9, he is called the great deceiver. 
like Ted Bundy. You remember Ted Bundy's, the horrible, notorious serial, serial killer? Do you know how he got his victims? He was a deceiver. He would pretend like his arm was broke, and he'd be in a parking lot at a grocery store with a bag of groceries acting all feeble, then he would drop the grocery bag. And then some poor unsuspecting woman would come to help him and pick up the bag and put it in his van and then like lightning speed of a cobra. He would render her unconscious and she would wake up into a living hell. That is the kind of enemy we're dealing with that could engineer such a mind like that. He doesn't play fair. He will find anything and everything to pick you apart. He will help you justify it. He will help you see it in a new light or a new way. Anything to separate you from God for, for about a half a second is all that he needs to get you on the train. And once you get on the train, it's everything that you want. It's all okay. It's moving. You know, it's kind of like when you get on the airplane, you're scared at first. But once you get in the air, it's just kind of like, oh, I'm in the air. That's all he's got to do is get you in the air. But there's even something bigger that we're dealing with. Today, it's, uh, it's like a psychological phenomenon. There's something more than jobs that deceive us, employers that twist our arm to do what we don't want to do. There's something more than the food that we eat and the music we listen to. It's called the zeitgeist. You know what a zeitgeist is? Zeitgeist, it means the spirit of the age. The people that we love are in the zeitgeist, the spirit of this age, which is an inc incredibly different worldview than any of us have ever grown up with. It is a worldview that everyone within it sees perfect harmony and reason for it. And trying to get them out of that is near an impossibility because everything about them, everything about that worldview they have makes sense to them. And this thing just didn't pop up in a vacuum. It's been coming for decades and decades and decades, if not centuries in its formation. And now we're beginning to see the, the, the fruit of it. We're beginning to see things that, whoa, wait a minute, that's strange. Well, wait a minute, that's weird. Whoa, it's too late. It's already here. The apparatus is in place. And most of the people we know and love are on board with it. It is a silver bullet, brother and sister, and it is, with lightning speed, about to finish its work. And too many people don't realize what's at hand. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, this is from the New Living Translation. It says it this way, and I think rightly so. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. It's foolishness to them. They don't see what you see in Jesus. They don't see any relevance. They don't see any need to even think about Christ. I have never, I mean, I've been doing Bible work my whole life. I have never been in a generation where people don't even know the Bible. You cannot no longer assume that people understand anything about Scripture. We are living in an age where Revelation 7 is coming to its completion, where the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the hearts of men. And it tells us later in the New Testament that the hearts of men will be failing them for fear of the things coming upon the earth. That's what we're up against. We're up against people that have just a glimmer of the Holy Spirit left. I don't think that flashy sermons, cool preachers, great music, buildings or structures are going to get it done anymore. We're up against something that no generation has ever been up against. The fair conductor. That's what we're up against. And we need to be reminded of this reality of this serpent that slithers about our feet that 
God has a, a plan. In verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 27, In that day sing to her a vineyard of red wine. Who's his vineyard? Man, right? Matthew chapter 21, verse 33. God's people are his vineyard. He's got a vineyard, and some of them are on that train. Some of us are, are, are in here today. I pray that all of us are part of that vineyard. In verse 3, he says, I, I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, least any hurt it. I keep it night and day. Fury is not in me. Who would set briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them all together. You hear the language of God. I, I, in other words, put it into context to the dream that we're talking about. I will go and take on that train myself. I will dive in through the windows. I have got to pull them out. I've got to save them. It's God who waters it. It's God who protects it. It's God who loves his people of this world. He loves humanity. He is in love with the human race. Verse 6, those who come, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. He has struck Israel as he struck those who struck him. Or has he been slain according to the slaughter of those who were slain by him in measure by sending it away you contend with it he removes it by rough wind in the days of the east wind therefore by this the iniquity of Jacob will be covered I know that's a bunch of uh, hard stuff to understand a bunch of strange words but it's basically talking about God who is going to be valiant in war to save people on the train the crazy train that the world thinks is the best place in the world to be And the purpose of Christ was no different in John chapter 12, verse 47. For I came not to judge the world, but to what? I came not to judge the world, Damon Sneed. I came to save the world. It was for this very purpose that he came, that he was born, that he was incarnate, that he took on flesh. Because we had no chance against the fair conductor. Not at all. Not in any way. And so he had to come, heaven's champion, had to come and walk this earth. The words spoken from heaven at his baptism were precious evidence to him that his father approved the steps he was taking in the plan of salvation as man's substitute and surety. The opening heavens and the descent of the heavenly dove were assurances that his father would unite his power in heaven with that of his son upon the earth to rescue men from the control of Satan and that God accepted the effort of Christ to link earth to heaven and finite man to the infinite God. That's why he came to this earth, because we are all at one time or other stuck on that train. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 4, I, I read it, but I want to read to you it in Blanco's paraphrase. Here's where Blanco is excellent. I am not angry, but I need to contend with my enemies. I will confront them that march against them in battle like briars and thorns that choke the vineyard. I will set them on fire and destroy them. God's saying, I'm not mad, I'm not a wrathful God, but I've got to do something to stop this madness that's going on in the world because left unchecked, it will completely finish off everybody. This is who we're to sing to, the Lord's vineyard. He's telling us that we're to sing to his people, we're to go to his vineyard. How do we sing to his vineyard? How do we aid Christ in helping people get off the train? What would you think? What are some common things that just are common sense that we should do to help God in aiding people get off the crazy train? Could you invite them to church, to abide, to prayer meeting, to Friday night, to Sabbath school? You could, but it's kind of hard to invite them if you yourself are not there. I mean, I'm just being honest. Do you really believe we're living at the end of time that these things are going on are not just coincidence? I heard this one person say, oh, here we go. The sky is falling again. The sky is falling again. Yeah, well, maybe it is falling. I mean, can't we invite people every time the church doors are open? Can't we say, hey, to my neighbor? I mean, all of us have about 12 people in our circle of influence. We know this. 
And God understands this. You can only have about 12 or 15 people that you're intimately connected with that would trust you enough that would come to church, it would come to an event, it would come to a meeting. If those 12 or 15 people in your life you were praying for, consistently praying and inviting and praying and inviting, sing to them by getting them into a place where the everlasting gospel is being preached. Not a social justice gospel, but a three angels message. Sing to them. I picture in my mind the fair conductor rushing by with all kind of people. I love the train. Just <laughs> there it goes. And there's all the people. And I, and I picture there I am sitting there watching this. And there goes Jesus running behind it, flashing and screaming and waving his arms and saying, get off of it, get off of it. That's the picture of the Gospels. Christ is running beside it as fast as he can, just praying and begging and pleading. And people are just looking at him going, Stand out there. Boy, it's your eternal life. That's what it is. I have another scene. As a fair conductor is, is chasing down the train. And he's running after it. And, and he's like, come on, guys, let's go. Let's go. And then he turns and he looks. And where is his guys? Where is the church? Where is his people? We're like, oh. Uh, Look at Jesus run. Boy, he's run. Oh, look at Jesus go. <laughs> and we're sitting there. Oh, yeah, look at Jesus chasing after the train. Oh, he's going fast, fast. He's going oh, what's, what's on the news? What's on TV? Oh, I'm going to go bow, knock a couple of holes in today. Can you imagine what the angels and what Christ himself what the angels are thinking is they're all running after this train with every fiber, with every ounce of their being. They're all running after this train. They're all begging and pleading because they know where it's going. And they look at his church, his church. And they're all just hanging out and doing this and chilling out and back at home. And goodness. I don't know about you. I've spent too much of my life watching Jesus chase after the train. I'm not going to let it go by in my life unabated. I am not going to let that thing swish by with people I know and love go by without giving my all. My money. Yes, my money. My tithe. It goes to the place where tithe is supposed to go. And my offering, it's going to go to the place where it needs to go. And it's going to be used. My tithe, that 10% that you're supposed to give, that half of the church does not give, it goes to the world church. They don't come here. It comes a little bit here through me, but it goes to the world church, so the pastor in Africa, so he can chase after the train too. The pastor down in South America, it goes to him so he can chase after the train. My offering, it goes here so we can chase after the train together. My time, my time is going to be used to chase after the train. Listen to this. Charles Spurgeon wrote this. One of the most powerful statements you will ever hear about chasing the train. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let no one go unwarned or unprayed for. That was Spurgeon. If you're going to go to hell, it's over my dead body. That's the kind of people that will make up God's church at the end of time. It's an axiom of truth. God don't need us. I was thinking about this morning. God doesn't need this church. He don't need you, me, our money. He don't need that building out there in the front. He don't need none of this. He's going to get his work done. But he's called us. He's called us to give everything we got to play our little part. 
And just because it's a little part don't mean, oh, well, he can get by without us. No, he's like, no, if you think you can, I can get by without you, you've got uh, problems. Probably is that you're on the train and you don't know it. Paul in 2 Corinthians, he just couldn't be more clear. God doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. Now all things are of God, right? Everything's going to come from God. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation? In other words, I pulled you off the train. Now I'm going to use you to pull other people off the train. Listen, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God pleads through us. It says to me that God is expects me to be at least trying to run right along the side of him, yelling and screaming and waving my arms the same way. I cannot give in to the zeitgeist. I cannot give in to us oh, the spirit of the age. There's nothing I can do about it. If I have to, I need to sneak on the train, go in disguise. Yeah, I'm one of y'all. But all along, a different agenda on our minds. He has put people in our charge. He has given us divine appointments. He has called us to live in this world. Yes, we got to make a living. I know you got to get careers. I know you're going to get married, young people. I, I know you've got lives to live. I understand that you've got plans. And to our older people, I understand you're retired, and you got your 401ks, and you've been living. I understand all that. I get all that. But outside of that, we need to be doing all that we can while we can. There could be nothing more irritating, right? Where Tim's out there somewhere. I know Tim's a fellow electrician. There could be nothing more irritating irritating to a master electrician who's working and he's right in the middle I've been so in the heat of battle knee deep in rattlesnakes trying to figure this out and I, and I say hey hey Fred would you get me my my strippers Fred Fred, Fred. and I'll get up and I'll get up where is he at and I go walk all the job and there he is at the water cooler <laughs> hey telling jokes with his friends drinking water and I'm like hey man you left me down in a hole. Come on. Man, are we left Jesus in a hole? Have we left him holding the tool bag all by himself because he can hold it? Yeah, he can hold it, but he's called me to be his helper. Because here is a truth. A truth is this. The door of mercy is going to shut one day. Heavenly intercession will cease. The seal will be given. The mark will be implemented. And I wonder what will a great many of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and children and friends and families think as they see the fair conductor come into the station. <sighs> All aboard. Too late to get off. Something that Pete Peterson, an oh, old friend of mine, he's passed from this earth, but he used to say this. When we're on the sea of glass, it'll be too late then. Too late to go to your neighbor. Too late to call up your child. Too late to try to make a difference. The money that you've held on so long to the very last minute, it will be too late to spend it. Too late to give it. There will come a time on the sea of glass that we will mourn and weep over lost opportunities. Can you imagine being in the kingdom of heaven? I'm so happy about 212 Valley Drive. I finally got the house down in Conroe. And finally all with I'm so happy about it. But I'm thinking, can you imagine the kingdom of heaven, how ridiculous that little place will seem to me? That I spent so much time, so much effort, so much money, so much focus on when time was ticking away. Have you ever seen one of those atomic clocks? Man, they're just, they're just flying. It's just the millisecond. That's time, man. It's flying right underneath our nose. And what that means is the train is coming to its end, its destination. And it means if you're on it, you need to get off of it. And if you're off of it, you need to try to help others to get off of it. But there's only one way that you can get off of it. And there's only one way that you're really going to be able to help others get off it. Only one way. You remember what Christ told Peter? 
Peter, when you are converted, when you become converted, then go feed my sheep. When you have really received my righteousness and you've opened your heart to my spirit and you become transformed, regenerated, and you start becoming like me, you will be able to feed my sheep powerfully. But until then, don't think you're feeding my sheep. You have to make sure that you're converted. If you're converted, you're going to be crying out after that train. If you're not crying out after that train, if you're not out there knocking on them doors, if you're not out there trying to find some way into people's lives, if you're not asking God for divine appointments, if you don't care, if you can picture someone in heaven not being there that you love, something's wrong in me. I missed a golden opportunity this week. To my everlasting shame, I woke up Friday morning, you know, the Bible says if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. You've got to walk in the spirit. It means you've got to get up. You've got to get on your knees. You've got to get connected. You've got to say, God, I'm a sinful human being. You know my flesh rules. Come into me. Be with me. Spend some time. I, didn't, I needed to get up. I needed to close on the house. I was out running around town all day being happy and jovial and laughing and cutting up with people and, and running back and forth to town to town in a golden opportunity. A divine appointment came, and I was not in the spirit. I was in the flesh, and I blew it. I did worse than blow it. I shut the door to someone else. I can't afford to wake up a day in my life and not realize the battle that's going on, not recalibrate my thinking and say, you know what? This is a big deal. Could it be, really? We were at time's end. Could it be, really? Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. We've got to quit saying, Jesus is coming again. We need to say, Jesus is coming is imminent. You know, I met when this voting booth was going over here. It was really a great idea that the church had. And I'm interested now. Don't be going and meddling into my politics to see who I'm interested in because I'm neutral but one of the ladies who was not neutral I walked in there she didn't know who I was boy she ran right up to me whoop, whoop, whoop. well as soon as I left <coughs> I was in there she seen my face and then she seen me I guess it was the safe zone where they could eat where they could there was a zone where they couldn't come in but as soon as I got outside there she was in a car she pulled right up beside my car and she handed me this and she started talking to me about the Republican Party said, oh, yeah, so we, I sat there for almost an hour, and I talked to her because I was interested in how, how politics works on these lower levels. She said, oh, I'm the precinct two chair. She says, there's 100 people like me. There's 100 precincts in Montgomery County, 100 precincts, and I'm one of 100 precinct chairs, and my job is to, to oversee precinct two, and so there's so many people in this geographic area that I, that I, and I said, and then I said, so you take care of, she goes, yes, I just take care, our call porter's over here, does it sound familiar? I just take care of this area, I, these are the streets, and I go, and I knock on doors, and I hand out flyers, and I talk to them about the Republican Party, and there's 99 other people just like me, and, and we're doing, we're energizing our base, is what she said. I got to talk to her. She says, yes. She says, you know, Montgomery County, it is red, 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 red. And it's the reason why Ted Cruz won. And it's the reason why Trump's going to win. And she was, going, she was just foaming and just talking to me. And there's this woman, this housewife. And the Republican Party this year has already raised a half a billion dollars for an election. It's like, man, I, I'm amazed with this. I said, oh, we need some Bible workers like this. She laughed. <laughs> She giggled. I said, no, I'm not kidding you. I said, this is how Bible workers are supposed to work. We're supposed to have a church full of Bible workers. What precinct are you over, brother? What precinct are you over? Where has God placed you? Where has he placed me? Man, if the Republican Party, if they acted like Damon Sneed does, and maybe some of you along with me, they would not exist. 
but they don't act like us because they'll tell you, uh, you know, don't call me a Republican or a Democrat, but I'm telling you, the Republican Party believes the future and welfare of the future of this country rests on Trump being reelected. And they give their money and their time and their life. Go out there. If you want to see the opposite, go to California where we just came from. And they are rabid about it because they believe the future and the, and the life and the welfare of the country is based on getting him out. What in the world is God's remnant church doing? <laughs> Why oh, do we not have that same kind of zeal and dogmatism and fervor and desire? How much do y'all need for a building? Okay, honey, the income tax came in. We don't need the new furniture. We don't need a new car. Let's just, let's, let's, hey, we've got to get that thing up. We've got to get going. Our pathfinders need money. The world church needs money. Let's give all that we can. Well, again, let's give our time. Let's get out. Let's help. Let's work. Let's do. Let's shake the bushes. Let's energize our base. Don't you think that the third angel's message is a little more important than what fool becomes our next president, the next talking head, the next promiser? Oh, man. Oh, man in heaven, God help us to stop what we're doing and realize the train the train. Who is on the train? Our call porters, where are they? Could y'all please stand up? If y'all haven't noticed, the conference is here with Southwestern. These are frontline. These are Navy SEAL, SEAL Team 6. <laughs> These guys, they got life to live. They got girlfriends to get and husbands to chase down and things to do. They are going out into the fray, man. They are just, that's where it's at. I'm telling you, that's where it's at. They are meeting front lines. They're going to go out there and they are going to get cards they're going to get cards like this, and they're going to get names on them. And there's going to be people saying, oh, yes, I'm, in, I'm interested in a cooking school. I'm interested, yes, in diabetes undone. I, I'm interested in this. Oh, and I'm interested in Bible studies. And they're going to bring these cards back. And like every other church I've ever been in, I've come into that church, there's a stack of cards this old, and they're 10, 15 years old. That is not going to happen here. So our call porters are doing some difficult work for us. But they are going to be handing us. Names on the train. And Mary is going to start a Bible worker training program. Some of you are going to be door knockers. Some of you, that's just too intense for you. Y'all ain't like these guys. Y'all can sit down, by the way. Thank you so much. Some of you might just need uh, a lead generated to give into you. Say, yes, go down there on this second street and just knock on the door and say, hey, you filled this card out. Any way I can help you. Some of you are just going to be here for our events. When, when we say Bible worker, that can mean all kind of things, but we need Bible workers. And what I want to I invite you to do, uh, as a matter of fact, is there anybody interested in doing Bible work anymore? Please, a show of hands, please. Yes, our church is 201. 20 people, Mary, 20, 25, 30. Look, if you're interested, Mary's going to be meeting over here or maybe right over here after the service, and she's going to give you information, and we're going to start a Bible worker training program here. And hopefully by the time these guys are done, we're going to have some practice runs. We're going to have, we're going to go out, and we're going to go chase the train. I know what you think. <laughs> But I'm telling you, when you realize Jesus is running right along beside you, and you realize the first time I started doing Bible work, and I started realizing the heavenly angels are right there with me, you, you door knockers know this. And you're all that adrenaline's pumping in you, and you're knocking on the door, and you're waiting. You don't know what you're going to get, and someone's mad, and someone slams the door, and someone says, didn't you read the sign, no solicitation? And another person giggles and laughs at you, another person looks through the window, and another person calls you a Mormon, another person calls you Jehovah Witness, another person does, and then you knock on that one door, and you open it up, and the, and the person says, I was just praying to God. 
and you walk in and you sell some books and you present the gospel and you leave someone with hope, you're going to get addicted. We need you. The Seventh-day Adventist Church needs you to be a Bible worker. We need you to help us. Church, we need you at this time to get serious about being a remnant Adventist believer. We need you. The world don't need you no more. They got plenty of people to replace you. They got plenty of people to cheer. They got plenty of people that want to spend their money. They got plenty of people that listen to their music. Plenty of people that listen to their movies. There's plenty of people out there to take your place. Please come. And God is going to bless us with or without you. But we want you to be with us. Is that fair? I think so. Let's have prayer. Ask God to bless us. Our Father in heaven, we just pray that we could help you fulfill this mandate of Isaiah chapter 27, this, this singing, this pleasant song to your vineyard, calling him off of that crazy train of destruction. We know the enemy is not going to let us idly go by and just attempt to thwart his plans. But Lord, in the words of Spurgeon, if they go to hell, it'll be over my dead body that they go. Let, let me be found clinging to their ankles, God. And let me be found broke and bankrupt. And having not done a whole lot of things in this world, but having been found a faithful runner with Jesus. May you bless us, Lord, we pray. May your Holy Spirit reside powerfully upon those of us that have made this decision in our heart to be a worker with you. May you bless them, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name.